One of the problems with organized religions is that there is this sense of separateness, that it's only good to be a Protestant, or that people who are Catholics are the only people who know the way. And I think now our current understanding of of quantum physics is this understanding of complete unity, and so that we have to derive our spirituality from a sense of unity. This is the basic journey of spirituality. When we ask the question, why am I feeling separate all the time? Speaking of God always conjures up the idea of the old guy with the white beard in the cloud, judging, observing, punishing, rewarding, or giving commands. Once you're on that track, you're totally off the path of spiritual evolution and development. The great appeal of all to people who don't want to grow up, but want the great parents in the skies looking after them, is to ask Jesus to do it for me. If only I place my trust in Jesus, he will save me from my sins and look after me and all will be well. Well, Jesus cannot eat my lunch for me and Jesus cannot be born for me and neither can Jesus save me because what we're talking about in this in real terms is not being saved by anyone, God or otherwise. We are talking about a personal evolution. The only reason that there is an addiction to religion is some way out of a mistake. Does that diminish the greatness of God? No, it actually opens the corral and lets God be eternal, absolute. The law that is given to us is the same law as given to that of those people on Cirrus given to us by the people in the Rose universe or the I universe. You know, in your Hubble telescope is finally seen galaxies of immeasurable beauty. That in our heart and in our mind we long to engage. It's exciting to meet beings of greater mind or lesser mind. And where does it end? It doesn't end. It doesn't end. We do not want to accept responsibility. We do not want to accept our greatness. So it's very easy for any system of thought, religious or otherwise, that comes along, it's very easy to play on that, to play on our insecurities, to assure us all is well, we'll all be taken care of. We lap that up. So don't blame religion. Blame our own insecurities, which has allowed religion to flourish, and which has allowed so many systems of thought that are disempowering to flourish throughout human history. That's why we can't get out of it. I now present to you Mr. and Mrs. Richard Buck Filipowski. <laughs> experiencing something in the present day that is a trigger to something that is very emotionally charged for us. So now we have become even more disconnected from the reality of what actually is. The new dream, like a thunderstorm in our brain, and its electrical strikes through our synaptic skies to the earth of our being, creates a chemical cascade in our body that prepares our body for conquest, achievement, a relishing experience emotionally. But we would have no conquest. Indeed, we would have no relishment if we had not first had that hologram and those chemicals that made us or rather changed us from being fearful entities 
into fearless entities after a dream. The frontal lobe is the crowning achievement of the human brain. Frontal lobe. This frontal lobe allows us a distinguishedness to change our minds. Through the workings of the nervous system and the particular way that it implements quantum effects, very distinct, specific way, not general, not fuzzy, not imprecise, that it absolutely does open the door for free will being a possibility that does not violate modern scientific tenets and that's consistent um, to a certain extent with people's subjective impression that we, that we do have free will. What separates us from all other species is the r ratio of our frontal lobe to the rest of the brain. The frontal lobe is an area of the brain that's responsible for firm intention, for decision making, for regulating behavior for inspiration. It is the seat of what causes us to take information from our environment and process it and store it in our brain to make decisions or choices that are different than the decisions and choices that we've made in the past. The brain is made up of tiny nerve cells called neurons. These neurons have tiny branches that reach out and connect to other neurons to form a neural net. Each place where they connect is integrated into a thought or a memory. Now the brain builds up all its concepts by the law of associative memory. For example, ideas, thoughts, and feelings are all constructed and interconnected in this neural net and all have a possible relationship with one another. The concept and the feeling of love, for instance, is stored in this vast neural net. But we build the concept of love from many other different ideas. Some people have love connected to disappointment. When they think about love, they experience the memory of pain, sorrow, anger, and even rage. Rage may be linked to hurt, which may be linked to a specific person, which then is connected back to love. Every observation can be looked upon as a quantum measurement. This quantum measurement produces memory. We always perceive something after reflection in the mirror of memory. It is this reflection in the mirror of memory that gives us that sense of I-ness who I am. The brain does not know the difference between what it sees in its environment and what it remembers because the same specific neural nets are then firing. We know physiologically that nerve cells that fire together wire together. If you practice something over and over again, those nerve cells have a long-term relationship. If you get angry on a daily basis, if you get frustrated on a daily basis, if you suffer on a daily basis, if you give reasons for the victimization in your life, you're rewiring and reintegrating that neural net on a daily basis, and that neural net now has a long-term relationship with all those other nerve cells called an identity. We also know that nerve cells that don't fire together no longer wire together. They lose their long-term relationship because every time we interrupt the thought process that produces a chemical response in the body, every time we interrupt it, those nerve cells that are connected to each other start breaking the long-term relationship. But if we practice our mental rehearsal and our skill in being able to do it, will show that certain brain circuits will grow as a result of our effort. We'll get, it'll get easier to do, in other words. If we accept that idea, then it will allow us to go back the next day and do it with more certainty and with more acceptance. That in itself is no different than praying. You see, there's no religious text that says thought doesn't matter. There's no religious text that doesn't say your prayer and your intention shouldn't be answered by God. But go explaining how that happens is what quantum physics and the observer is all about. But still, when we can make thought more real than anything else, our brain is designed to do that. The frontal lobe with its enormous space is the altar in which we place a thought. And it gives us the permission to hold the thought for an extended period of time, and it lowers the volume to the external stimuli. We lose track of time and space. That's the moment we're stepping into the quantum field. That's the moment that now we're making thought more real than anything else.